Good morning, everybody, and happy, oh my gosh, what day is it? Happy Thursday. Ooh, all right, happy Thursday. We are almost through another week of our e-learning. We're getting close to the end. Before I review the last half of Act 3 with you guys, I want to just give you kind of a quick snapshot of what is coming up. So we are going to be starting, once we finish the final act of The Crucible, we're going to be starting To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Okay, now um, I have a digital link to this book that you guys can obviously use for free. Um, it's available free online through that link. The formatting might be a little weird, just like the PDF version of The Crucible tends to get a little weird sometimes. But if you're a person that likes to have the physical copy of the book with you, I just wanted to give you a heads up so that you can order it. Um, I think it's like $7 on Amazon. It's like $9 from Barnes & Noble. You can get the Kindle version for like $10. So just so you guys know, that is coming up. We're going to start that next week towards next week, Thursday. So a week from today, we're going to be starting to read To Kill a Mockingbird. So if you want the physical copy of the book, just make sure that you get that ordered soon so that it arrives in time for you. But otherwise, I'll give you the digital copy for free. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get started with reviewing the second half of Act 3 of The Crucible. So remember in the first half, uh, we left off with Danforth calling all of the girls in so that he could question them in front of Mary Warren and Proctor as to the truth of where Mary Warren's statement. Because remember, Mary Warren and Proctor are claiming that the girls have been pretending this entire time and that they're faking all of these like demonic possessions or witch witching things that are happening. So Danforth calls the girls in. Um, now I want you guys to kind of look at the way that he questions these girls. Okay, the wording that he uses is very telling um, and kind of influences what the girls say. So he says here, but likewise children, the law and Bible damn all bearers of false witness. Now then, it does not escape me that this deposition may be devised to blind us. It may well be that Mary Warren has been conquered by Satan, who sends her here to distract our sacred purpose. If so, her neck will break for it. Okay, so he's kind of giving them um, an excuse that they can use, right? He's saying he, she already may be possessed by Satan. And the girls are hearing this and like, oh, yeah, we could pretend that she's a, 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 like possessed by Satan, too. Right. And then Danforth continues to say, but if she speak true, I bid you now drop your guile and confess your pretense for a quick confession will go easier with you. Is there any truth in this? OK, so he's kind of like threatening them here. Right. And um, giving them kind of an out by if they pretend that Mary Warren is is doing Satan's work then maybe they won't get in trouble and they can continue with this ruse. So the wording here really kind of influences how the girls respond. So obviously Abigail just denies and denies and denies what Proctor and Danforth are saying. And Proctor really starts losing it on Abigail and he starts revealing all of these truths about her. So he says, it is not a child referring to Abigail now hear me, sir, in the sight of the congregation, she were twice this year put out of meat and house for laughing during prayer. So during their service, during their church service, Abigail laughed out loud during prayer. He also reveals Abigail le leads the girls into the woods and they've danced there naked. Mr. Paris discovered them in the dead of night. There's the child that she is. So Danforth hadn't known that before. So really, Abigail is starting to look not so good. And Proctor continues, she only pretended to faint. They're excellent. Your Excellency, they're all marvelous pretenders. Okay, so here he's talking about Mary Warren, where she pretended to faint, and also all the other girls that they're pretending. Now, when Proctor says this, um, Hathorne comes in, and so Hathorne is one of the other judges, and asks, can Mary Warren pretend to faint now? So Paris says, prove to us how you pretended in the court so many times. So Mary Warren here is put on the spot, right? She's basically being asked to prove that she was pretending by pretending again. Now, just to kind of give you an idea, because we know that Mary Warren can't faint, right? She says, I cannot tell how, but I did. I heard the other girls screaming and you, your honor, you seem to believe them. And it were only sport in the beginning, but then the whole world cried spirits. And I promise you, I only thought I saw them, but I did not. Okay, so she can't faint. 
because she's not in the heat of the moment. This would be like if you guys are, you know, walking in the woods in the middle of the night with a couple of your friends and your friends all start to get really creeped out um, because they think that they see something rustling in the bush bushes. And then you start to get creeped out because you're like, oh, my gosh, I think I saw it rustling in the bushes, too. Right. That atmosphere that you're in really impacts your emotions and how you behave. The atmosphere she's in now um, is completely different than the atmosphere she was in before when she did faint, right? So it would be like, okay, you're creeped out in the woods with your friends, but if you're all like sitting in your living room, you know, watching TV and one of your friends is like, oh my gosh, and it's, you know, broad daylight and one of your friends is like, oh my gosh, I think I just saw something rustling in the bushes outside you're not going to be creeped out. You're probably just going to be like, oh, it's probably just like a squirrel or something. Okay. So the atmosphere, the place that they're in and how the moods of other people around you, they really impact how you feel. Okay. If people around you are tense, you're probably going to be feeling some of that tension. Um, people around Mary Warren were screaming, claiming that they heard, heard spirits. They were, you know, very scared. And she kind of just latched onto that, right? She's a very nervous girl and she's very easily influenced by other people. So when she's in this calm setting where there are no spirits and the other girls aren't screaming and pretending, she can't, she can't faint, right? Because um, she's really not that good of an actress unless she feels what other people are feeling. So then what happens is Abigail starts to be kind of um, really threatened by Danforth. So he said, child, I do not mistrust. I would have you consider like all of these things. And then when Abigail is threatened, she starts to claim that she sees spirits, right? And she even threatens Mr. Danforth. Let you beware, Mr. Danforth. Think you to be so mighty that the power of hell may not turn your wits. Beware of it. And then she starts to look into the air and is truly frightened. So she's having another one of these episodes where somebody is attacking her, right? Some sort of witch is casting their spirit. A cold wind has come. And Mary Warren's pleading like, Abby, don't do this. You're faking it. Your honor, I freeze. And Proctor's, they're pretending. Now you have to imagine when this is happening, like the scene is really chaotic, right? Because you have this group of girls that's sitting there doing exactly what Abigail's doing. So they all start going like this. They're like, oh my gosh, it's so cold. It's so cold. And they're like looking around and they're like, oh no, what is happening, right? So they're all pretending and people are starting to like get really heightened emotions here. Proctor's like, they're pretending, they're pretending. Mary Warren is terrified, like cowering. They're like, don't stop it, Abby, stop it. Um, the movie, you guys, the movie does a great job at kind of portraying the scene. So really highly recommend you watch it when we're done reading the play because it'll give you a good idea. And then Proctor, after this episode, really just snaps, right? And he calls Abigail a whore. And that's when he tells the truth. I have known her, sir. I have known her. So he confesses that they slept together. And he uses that as kind of evidence. Like a man will not cast away his good name. You surely know that. She thinks to dance with me on my wife's grave. And um, I know you must see it now. So he really kind of puts his reputation on the line in order to prove that these girls are lying. But Danforth is still hesitant to believe him. So Danforth calls in Elizabeth, okay, Proctor's wife, to kind of um, to find out the truth about whether or not Abigail and Proctor really slept together because Proctor says that his wife knows, right? And um, Elizabeth fired Abigail, we find out, because Elizabeth knew that she was sleeping with her husband. And so Danforth is going to question Elizabeth as to the truth of this. And Elizabeth, if Elizabeth tells the truth, right, then it's going to be the final nail in the coffin for Abigail and all the other girls who are pretending. And it's going to prove that they, that they're speaking false. But, but when Elizabeth enters, you guys, um, Danforth has Proctor and Abigail face away from her. They're not even allowed to look at her. So here is this woman, this very saint of a woman, Elizabeth, called to basically tell the entire world that her husband cheated on her. And that is a serious sin. It'll ruin his reputation. So when Danforth questions her, she denies it. 
right? She finally says, no, sir. And notice in this section, you guys, she kind of tries to skirt around giving a direct answer. She's like, my husband is a goodly man. Um, and she's very hesitant to say like, yes, I fired Abigail because she slept with my husband and she wants to save Proctor's reputation. So she finally does say no. And Proctor says when she's being dragged out, she only thought to save my name. And notice this interaction too. When Elizabeth's being dragged out, Proctor yells, Elizabeth, tell the truth. Elizabeth, I have confessed it. And Elizabeth goes, oh God. Like she's like, oh no, what have I done, right? Because then she realizes that um, she's kind of ruined Proctor's chances of revealing the truth. Hale tries to speak some sense into Danforth saying it's a natural lie to tell to, you know, save your husband's reputation. I beg you stop now before another is condemned. I may shut my conscience to it no more. Right. So he's really speaking up for Proctor and kind of taking his side and trying to get Danforth to see reason because he's kind of starting to realize that Danforth is a little corrupt in the way that he's running the courtroom. And then we have this big section where Abigail starts to become possessed again and they turn on Mary Warren and all of the girls are mimicking everything that Mary Warren says and does, which like imagine a group of people mimicking your every word. Um, that's kind of, it's annoying and also frightening, right? Like it's kind of out of the blue and you know, they have your life kind of in their hands. So, um, you know, Danforth, he <clears throat> he again here threatens Mary Warren, says, you will confess yourself or you will hang. Do you know who I am? I say you will hang if you do not open with me. And as a way out, Mary Warren thinks her only way out is to turn on Proctor. And she says, don't touch me. Don't touch me to Proctor. You are the devil's man. I'll not hang with you. I love God. I love God. So she really only turns on Proctor because she thinks it's the only way to save her life. Remember, Danforth had told her before, if you were lying either in the courtroom or you're lying now, you're going to go to jail no matter what. But this way, if she turns on Proctor and calls him the devil and says that Proctor was possessing her, then she kind of has an easy out, right? Because then she said like she wasn't lying in the courtroom wasn't lying in the courtroom. And she's now saying that Proctor possessed her to say all these things. So it's not her fault. So this is the only way where she's really truly let off the hook and can return and have all of her friends back, Abigail and the girls, and be part of like this, um, you know, kind of like sainthood in the town. So she continues on with this lie. My name, he want my name. I'll murder you, he says. If my wife hangs, we must go and overthrow the court, he says. So she's really just putting the nail in, in Proctor's coffin now. And Proctor has this really famous speech when he's being arrested or realizes that his time has come, right? He says, I say God is dead. And that's one of his most famous lines. And then he has this section. Right. He says, a fire, a fire is burning. I hear the boot of Lucifer. I see his filthy face. He doesn't really, you guys. What he's saying, and it's he says, it's my face and yours, Danforth. He's saying the devil has taken over Salem and he is in every one of us that is, you know, giving in to these lies that these girls are spinning. God damns our kind, especially, and we will burn. We will burn together. So he's saying the entire town is corrupt and the entire town is going to burn in hell for what they're doing here. <sighs> Pretty powerful speech to end the act with and kind of a grim note, right? Where where Proctor has been arrested. He is going to jail for witchcraft. Um, so there really is no escape from the corrupt court in Salem. And you guys, I want to just kind of remind you, this all happened, right? This is a true thing that actually happened. And it's really uh, similar to what happened during McCarthyism. Okay, people were put on trial for the littlest of things, like the most insignificant evidence um, they were they were tried for as communists. And it ruined a lot of people's lives. Like a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their credibility, their reputation because of these corrupted court proceedings. So this is not something that happened so, so long ago, right? It's happened in, in our modern era. So just kind of keep this in mind because we need to learn from these happenings of the past in order to be able to prevent them from happening again in the future. 
So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, you are going to take your Act 3 quiz. We just have the Act 3 quiz today, and we will start Act 4 tomorrow. So I'll have a little video kind of introducing what to look for at the start of Act 4. Don't forget to go outside, get some sunshine, do something that lights your soul on fire, and reach out to friends and families, right? Go have a game night or something on Zoom. It'll be lots of fun. I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a good day.